Joseph Holger, thanks for joining us for another one of these uh, live stream Mondays coming to you 9 a.m. Monday mornings uh, to uh, you know, get you ready for the stock market this week. All the stocks I'm watching, some of the news you need to know about, as well as a, a topic. I got a great topic for you uh, this week. You know, we, we know the, the market's in its best streak since November of last year, November 2021. Um, you know, has has rebounded. This Nasdaq is actually 20% higher than uh, its June lows. The S and P has taken back more than half of its uh, of its drop this year. But uh, you know, all all is not right with the uh, the world of uh, in the economy, right? The economy continues to weaken. The housing market continues to weaken. We're going to talk about that. Uh, so we really want to look at okay. So how is the stock market not like the economy? How is it disassociated from the economy? And uh, you know, can rise when the economy is falling. But what's that next shoe to drop? You know, if the uh, if the housing market does get worse, uh, if the housing market do crash does get worse, then will that take stocks with it? Uh, will that be a, a second shoe to drop? on the stock market. Uh, you know, despite the uh, despite the the drop off or the 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 rise in stocks, you know, I've been kind of skeptical about the uh, about the rally. I've been thinking more it's more like a bear market rally where we do see stocks fall back down uh, a little bit as we really come to that realization that uh, inflation isn't going away. The Fed has just started raising its interest rates and that is slowing down the economy. Uh, and we will see we will see that uh, that effect on the jobs market and the uh, the jobs picture uh, start starting pretty soon. But you know, in these times of real uncertainty in the market, whether it can go up or whether it can go go down, it just proves that you you don't want to be uh, one on one side, you know, of the uh, of the table, right? Because uh, yeah, you know, it, it's uh, everybody's very skeptical of this market, whether how much higher it can go, and, and whether it's just a, another bear market rally. Um, but you don't want to miss out on the, uh, the the tremendous run we've had over the last four weeks either, right? Uh, by the same token. You know, you can be as bullish as you want, but you can't deny that the economy is weakening. Uh, we are in for a, a recession if we're all, not already in one. And you don't want to be fully invested in stocks either. You want to give yourself an opportunity to take advantage of those lower prices when we get to them. So that's why we've been talking about the barbell strategy, you know, over the last uh, over the last couple of months, actually. And it's one that I'm using in my own portfolio. And the barbell strategy, uh, if you haven't heard yet, uh, we've been talking about it. It's uh, really if you imagine a barbell with the weights on each side, right, and then just the little connector in the middle. But you've got all the weights on each side, and um, and those weights really represent uh, two different types of investments. Okay, so so in this kind of environment, I, I have a lot in growth stocks, right? I've got my Teladoc, I've got my SoFi and PayPal, um, some of those other growth stocks that are very cyclical, very uh, high high risk, high reward bets, right? And those are going to do very well when the market increases. In fact. You know, my portfolio, just my E-Trade portfolio, you know, one of one of about seven different platforms that I use, just my E-Trade portfolio went up 88,000 uh, in in uh, J July alone on that rebound because uh, because of those growth stocks. Right. But you also want that protection. Right. Uh, so on the other side of this barbell, you've got the safety stuff, um, mostly cash, cash like investments like maybe bonds, uh, I bonds, safety sectors, things like that. So you've got nothing in between. And this is a very hard strategy for you know value investors, for dividend investors, because they're really kind of that in between space that doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't rise as much, you know. If the market rises, you know, growth stocks are always going to outperform in a bull market versus value stocks. Whereas, so so, and then you know, it doesn't quite protect you from the uh, from a stock market crash either, though. Uh, dividend stocks, even. Uh, even value stocks, you know, while they are cheap on a relative basis, they're still going to fall in a stock market crash or if stocks head lower. So that's kind of that in between space that you're you're kind of avoiding there. Um, but if you can, if you can adopt that kind of a strategy, then it can work very well because you know, despite having about 25% of my money in cash and those cash-like investments right now, uh, you know, I still did very well in the month of you know over the past four or five weeks, uh, especially in the month of July there, because I had that growth stock side of the barbell. Uh, so just something to think about, you know, as you, um, you know, as we as we get further into this this bull market run or bear market rally, uh, whatever you want to uh, whatever you want to think of it as.
I want to get to our topic today, though, because we've got a, a great topic again. See everyone there out there in the Bowtie Nation. Great seeing everybody there. Chad, Chad there from uh, uh, Lifters Gym. Joseph Flory de- doing his best. Uh, Adrian Cronauer there in the uh, you know in, in the chat. Deep 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 salmon. Tim, Timor from Saudi Arabia, which is awesome to see. You know everybody from from all over the world. We're at in the uh, the Bowtie Nation. You're coming too. Uh, Melissa, good to see you. Melanie, good to see you all, always. Melanie, longtime citizen there of the uh, the Bowtie Nation, and and Michael Preston. Good to see everybody there. Uh, so I do want to get to our topic today because, well, basically because I just want to get back. I want I want to get to that Q and A section, which is my favorite. Why I do these uh, live streams really to to connect with all, all you out there. Now I do want to uh, I do want to throw a pitch in for uh, Weeble. Okay, so you know this is uh, the. The, the, the slowdown in investor interest, you know, not, not as many new investors this year. People are a little less interested in uh, investing when they can go out inside and do other things, right? Uh, so the platforms, the investing platforms are throwing tons of cash, tons of money at their marketing e- uh, efforts, folks. And, and, you know, I mean, whether you want to use Webull as a platform, I use it as a platform because I love the stock simulator uh, on it, uh, like some of the other research uh, you get from it. But even if you're not interested in Webull, in, uh, you know, Moomoo, in some of these other platforms that, that we talk about every once in a while, take advantage of these free stocks, man, because because uh, they are just pumping up the free stocks. I put a link up there in the chat. If you're coming to us later, I'll put it in the description as well. Use that link, open up an account, and deposit one penny. Uh, used to be you had to deposit at least $100. They've dropped that, that down to one penny. You uh, you deposit one penny, and they're going to give you up to 12 free stocks. Okay, uh, you know, it's uh, they say it's up to like $12,000 total for, for all the stocks. In truth, it ends up being you know right around uh, right around seven to ten dollars each on average. But uh, again, you know if you even get just just the ten free stocks, um, ten bucks each, that's a hundred dollars for depositing one penny. So take advantage of these offers. Uh, they'll have instructions there. When you click through that link, basically you just open an account, deposit any amount, uh, and they're gonna they're gonna deposit those. It does take it does take a few days for all that to clear and for you to get your free stocks, but you will get them. Uh, we've gotten confirmation from people that that they are getting their free stocks, and uh, and and you'll help be helping support the channel. So I appreciate that. Uh, it's just really basically a no cost, low cost kind of way to uh, to help support the channel and, and do what we do here. I do want to get to uh, get to. Our uh, our topic this week because you know the the stock market or the housing market is undeniably weaker, right? Uh, my wife and I, you, you, all you out there in the Bowtie Nation, know we're planning our trip to to Tampa or our, our move to Tampa. Actually, got a firm date for the 28th of this month. So after two years of planning, that is happening. But over the past two years, we've had to just agonize over housing prices, right? And especially in Florida, especially in Tampa, uh, where they've been up you know 30, 40 percent, and. Uh, and that has started to cool down. You know, the uh, the National Association of Realtors reported that sales of new homes hit a two-year low last month. Uh, existing home sales are down four are, are down fourteen percent from a year ago. Uh, we can look at some of the uh, some of the data here just to kind of show you uh, what's happening in the housing market. And th- the the problem here is that housing is linked so many ways to the economy. Housing is linked through construction, right? The construction, all the construction jobs, the the uh, you know not just construction but all the materials and supplies they use uh, with the economy it's linked through those transactions so think everybody involved in a home sales uh, transaction you know through from the lawyers the escrow agents to the uh, and everyone else the taxes involved um, as well as just uh, you know just other things the jobs and things like that so there are so many linkages between the housing market and the economy that where housing where housing goes the economy often follows so you really want to be watching for that and how it's going to affect for stocks and that's what we're going to talk about today now this is the so this is the economic research from the uh, St. Louis Fed right great research tool uh, all all free charts and, and graphics and data online there from Fred Economic Data and this one shows the median sales price of of houses sold in the United States states, right? And I've adjusted this for a year over year price increase, right? So what this is showing us back to 2000, right? 2000 all the way over here on the left, uh, the year over year price increase in the uh, the median home price in the United States. And you can see, you know, for uh, a lot of years, it's, it's right around back and forth around 5%, right? Which is a, about a good average for home prices to increase every year, you know, keeping up with inflation, that kind of thing, without really getting uh, overbought or oversold. 
Of course, here in the uh, you know 2003 to 2006, we saw that really big jump. You know, uh, 2004 home prices increased 15% in that year uh, to the to the fourth quarter. We really started to uh, inflate that housing bubble that led to the crash in 2008. But if we fast forward all the way here to uh, to recently. And you can see just what a boom housing has had over the past couple of years. Okay, just uh, Q3, so third quarter of last year, home prices increased by 21% on a year-over-year -year basis. That was even more than that was even more than in the housing boom. Okay, and if we we can we can increase this out to the max, I mean that was so at no other we had 87, 1987, they were up 17% in a year. Uh, no other time other than back in the early 70s, 1973, home prices went up 22%. And of course, that's when we had that double digit runaway inflation, uh, you know, inflation rates of, of 10 to 20% some, some years there in the 70s. Uh, and and uh, of course, you know, a lot of the culprit this last year has been that inflation. Inflation hit 9.1% last month, uh, or 8.6% actually the last month and 9% the, the month before. Uh, and has really driven that surge in home prices. Well, that, that started to come down. You know, you can see here it's down 15% on a year over year basis. We got those, uh, those National Association of Realtor numbers that uh, existing home sales are down. So the housing market is slowing down. Uh, the question is, how far does it go? Do we get something like the housing market crash we saw in 2008? Uh, or is it much more of a mild, uh, a mild slowdown? And how does that affect the economy? And how does that affect stocks, especially, you know, some of the related stocks like, like Home Depot, which is going to report its earnings this, uh, this week, we'll be watching, watching for that. So, you know, to be clear, I, I don't think we're talking about anything like the 2008 crash. We just haven't seen the excesses, even though house prices have increased quite a bit more uh, over the last year. We haven't seen the excesses in uh, in the housing market. Right. We, we didn't see those ninja loans. Right. The no income, no job uh, application loans, the no doc loans that we had before the 2008 uh, bubble. So we don't, we really don't have that that weakness in or that potential for defaults. We don't have the leverage in the collateralized market right back there before 2008. A lot of the the banks and the and the and the institutional funds were creating those collateralized mortgages, collateralized mortgage obligations, uh, CDOs, other things like that that really levered up the uh, the increase that we saw there in 2008. We don't have that right now. The banks are in much better position. Uh, the child's market is still extremely strong and, uh, and household finances are, are still pretty strong, you know, with, uh, with savings higher than they were um, back then. Debt to income quite a bit lower. So, you know, even if, even if housing prices do come down, even if the jobs market, you know, weakens a little bit, you're not going to see that huge wave of defaults that we saw in, uh, in bankruptcies and things like that and foreclosures like we saw in 2008 that really crushes the housing market. You know, we are expecting, uh, you know, more weakness though. Like I said, uh, Moody's Analytics actually reviewed over 400 of the largest U.S. housing markets um, and found that you know, on their estimation, on their models, that about half of those, about 210, would probably see uh, house price declines. Uh, you know, over the next over the next two years. Now, you know, what we want to talk about here is the difference between a decline in home prices and just slowing growth, right? So we saw in that chart just a little bit ago that uh, home prices has, had grown, uh, had, had increased, you know, 15% on a year year over year basis. We're up as much as 22% last year. Um, so in a lot of markets, in about half the markets in the United States, Moody's is saying that uh, about half of those markets that you're not going to see home price declines, but you won't see that kind of growth, right? Growth uh, increase in home prices might only grow at 5%, which if inflation is still at 8%, that still means you're losing money, right? Because you're losing 8% uh, purchasing power on your dollar, using losing 8% of the value of all your savings, all your dollars, uh, things like that. And your house, your house value is only going up five percent. So you're still seeing some kind of a, a loss on that, but it's not obviously your your house. You're not watching your house price decline. Okay, so most markets, about half the markets there, uh, not not declining, but not growing nearly as fast. In the other half, they are seeing a a, a, a decline. Um, you know, the, the de average decline is probably only about 5%, 5 to 10% at the most for a lot of these. Some of the markets, obviously, you know, real estate is always local. Uh, some of those markets are expected to see larger declines. And, you know, uh, turns out about five of the top 10 markets to see, expected to see declines are in Florida. You know, Florida has seen some of the highest 
uh, home price increases over the last couple of years. So naturally, they're expected to see some of the largest decreases. Uh, the villages there in, in Florida is expected to see the biggest decline, about 13% over the next two years. Um, so yeah, you know, Moody's Analytics uh, and a lot of the other sources seeing, you know, kind of half and half on the housing market, not a crash, certainly, but, uh, but definitely expecting uh, a slowdown in that. On average, Moody's does estimate, you know, just going back uh, on their day, all the way on their data, as far as home price increases year over year, uh, what it should be to keep up with the economy. They do see the average home price uh, on the national market 24% overpriced right now. Okay, so that is uh, that's something that's going to take a little while to uh, to to really. Uh, to really balance out in the economy, right? If we don't see, you know, massive uh, losses, declines in home prices, uh, how do you work out a 25, 24% overvalued? It just takes time, right? The economy has to grow, wages, inflation has to grow, while home prices stay, stay relatively, uh, relatively subdued. That's how you're going to see that balance and home prices come back down. Uh, so I don't think you're going to see a crash. You're just going to see kind of a, a long stagnation in, uh, in home prices. Now, uh, a couple of uh, a couple of other data points that we can we can look at here, kind of back that up. We've got uh, we've also got here's the existing home sales, uh, and you can see back in June, January 22 hit uh, 6.5 million on a on an annualized basis, so six and a half million uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, homes existing home sales in that month, January of this year. And that's really when you start seeing the, the decline. Okay, we had 5.9, 5.7. They are now down to just 5 million on an annualized basis. So down, uh, you know, a million and a half. That's, uh, what, what is that, about 17, 17 18% uh, drop in the, uh, in the existing home sales. We can also look at the monthly supply. This is, this is something that's been really a big factor on the market. There just hasn't been houses to, uh, available to, uh, to sell, right? People weren't putting their houses on the market. Construction has not kept up with the the, the demand for housing, and uh, and we had very low supply uh, of houses houses available. Now because the uh, sale the the existing sales so the monthly sales of of new houses or or that demand has fallen off a cliff, then we have started to see monthly supply increase. So that's a good thing right there, kind of stabilizing the market um, where it is. But again, you know the uh, <clears throat> the fact that uh, that construction just hasn't kept up with demand. Uh, there's still a very strong demand for housing. Just leads me to believe, and, and we didn't get those excesses. Just leads me to be believe that we're not seeing a home price crash. Okay, we're not going to see a crash. Um, we're still seeing very strong occupancy rates at apartments. I think equity residential. So one of the largest uh, apartment owners in the United States actually reported, I think, 16% increase in sales uh, over the last quarter, uh, which is which is huge for an apartment uh, an apartment company to report a 16% increase in revenue. And that's basically all on the back of increased rents, right? So they're increasing rents and still being able to hold that occupancy level uh, fairly stable. Which obviously means that uh, you know buyers just have have no have no other option, right? They have to they have to uh, take those rent increases because you know prices are going up for to own as well as to rent, and uh, and the the housing market is still relatively strong. Uh, you know, looking in this as far as stocks, uh, the home improvement uh, stocks, I, I think, and we'll look at the Home Depot in, in a little bit because they are reporting earnings this week. Home improvement retailers are probably going to feel more weakness at least for the next two quarters. Okay, just until we get that uncertainty around the housing market. Again, I don't think you know if we don't get a housing market crash, uh, then it's not going to bleed so much over into the economy that it really brings the the, the rest of the stock market down. But it is going to affect those those housing market related stocks. So you think you know home home improvement retailers, obviously, uh, you know even if even if it, the the housing market doesn't crash, just that uncertainty about you know how how much lower home prices will go or can go uh, is going to keep the uncertainty in those stocks and really keep those those stocks depressed you've got the mortgage REITs okay so the mortgage REITs that uh, that buy that that borrow and then you know buy those mortgages obviously if there is less home buying uh, less mortgage demand then those you know those are going to have a, a lower inventory to buy for those investments so mortgage REITs are going to be under pressure uh, any of those you know any of those housing related stocks are really going to be under pressure but but I don't think you really need to take this into your larger investing strategy because again it's not going to be a housing market crash and it's not going to bleed over into the the broader economy and, and into the broader stock market
So I want to uh, I want to turn it back turn it over into our uh, stock market stock market news for the week. Uh, look at kind of some of the things I'm watching this week. We'll start off with the stocks I'm watching. Uh, earnings is all but over. Uh, really, we've got uh, one or two more weeks of uh, earnings trickling, and this week it's going to be largely the retailers. Uh, the late late in the earnings season, the retailers always come out. Walmart, Target. Uh, we've got the um, retail sales numbers, which is going to be really important this week. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that here. But uh, but Walmart starts us off with a, a very heavy retailer reporting week this tomorrow when it reports its second quarter earnings on Tuesday. Uh, Walmart expected to post earnings of $1.62 a share. That's down 9% from last year, but on sales growth of 7%, okay, to $151 billion. And so this is really the this is really the story of the second quarter, right? What, the story we've seen from most companies is that they are raising their raising their prices so much that they are reporting great sales growth, in amazing revenue growth, 7% there expected out of Walmart, but their earnings are going down, down 9%. So you've got a 16% gap there between their sales growth and their earnings growth. And again, it's just because, you know, even though they're raising their prices, they're not able to pass on all that inflation onto, uh, onto customers. Okay, they're just too worried that customers won't take it. They'll go somewhere else and shop. And, uh, and so they're not raising their prices to, to cover all the, you know, all, the, uh, all the inflation and all the increased costs. So, um, so you've really got a problem with profitability for a lot of these companies. They're warning uh, investors about the uh, about the next two quarters and really about the outlook for the rest of the year and next year. And that's what's bringing stocks down. You know, the shares of Walmart plunged 20% on its last quarterly report, right? Uh, back there in May, I believe it was, shares were down 20% in just a couple of days after it reported those inventory issues, right? Where it had uh, way too much inventory and was looking to, to, to have to really slash prices on those and the inflation that caused it to miss earnings by 12%, right? You know, uh, this is Walmart. The, Walmart does not miss earnings, right? I think that over the past... Um, over the past three years, Walmart's only missed its earnings expectations like on three quarters, and it missed it by 12% uh, on the last quarter. That's you know that's why it really dipped that 20%. Shares are up only 11% over the past three months, uh, and, and but the second quarter is typically strong, right? I, I think with Wal in Walmart's case tomorrow, I, I think you've got uh, really that kind of shock on the uh, on the second quarter earnings uh, expectations were lowered so far. That I think they, they they have a chance to really surprise on the upside, right? The stock is trading under the long term average on its price to earnings basis, so relatively cheap there on a, on a PE basis there for Walmart, and, and expectations are just so low that that it could be a, a positive surprise, uh, kind of a relief rally for Walmart when it reports. Switching to Home Depot again, those housing related stocks uh, also going to be closely watched on Tuesday as it really just a sign for the housing market. Uh, it's expected to report a 9% year-over-year increase in earnings on a 6% revenue growth. So this is interesting that that Home Depot, especially you know, I, I mean a housing-related company, is able to leverage up its revenue into higher earnings growth. Okay, kind of just the opposite of what we were just talking about with Walmart and all the other companies, where their their earning or their sales, their revenue is only up 6%, only expected to be up 6% over the last year, but their act they're they're going to be able or expected to be able to leverage that up to a nine percent uh, year over year increase in earnings. So somehow, you know, Home Depot uh, or investors expect Home Depot to have found a way to to really uh, you know pass all those increased inflation, all those increased costs, wages, everything onto the customer, uh, be able to uh, to lever that up through uh, through debt and you know and, and cost cutting, right? Just just lowering their own costs. And uh, and turn that six percent revenue growth into nine percent earnings growth. I'm a little skeptical though uh, on two parts here. You know the uh, the company has only missed expectations on on uh, one quarter in the last fifteen. So in the last fifteen quarters, they've only missed uh, they've only missed expectations in one of those. Uh, but the bar seems especially high for the second quarter, especially that idea of you know them being able to lever up their their growth so much, uh, as well as just you know six percent revenue growth, nine percent year over year earnings growth on on a housing related company like that. Again, most companies are reporting that slower earnings growth than revenue, uh, so I, I'm kind of worried that one, you know, they might miss their expectations. You know, the, the, they might come out and say, "Hey, you know, we we just had the inflation and costs were just so high. We did not. We got good revenue growth, like most companies are reporting, but we did not hit that nine percent year-over-year increase in earnings." Uh, what's more, what's what worries me more though, and it's something that. 
uh, we've seen on, on most of these companies. Most companies, you know, have been able to beat their earnings expectations um, over the last quarter, but they're warning about the rest of the year, right? They're coming out and say, hey, we did fine over the second quarter. We did actually better than we thought, but these next couple of quarters are going to be weak. And, 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 you know, that's never more, never more uh, relevant here than, than in those housing related companies like Home Depot, where we are seeing a slowdown in the housing market. They're going to have to acknowledge that. They're going to have to come out and say, hey, you know what, uh, the, the earnings expectations for the rest of the year and even into next year, 2023, might not be uh, all it's, uh, you know, all, all we expect, okay? And, and that's been shocking, shocking those stocks, right? It's when, when management says that, when management puts that kind of uncertainty into the market on their stock, then, then obviously it hits the shares. Uh, shares of Home Depot are down 22% this year and trading for about 20 times price to earnings. That's just under the 23 times average over the last three, five years. Uh, so it's not uh, it's not expensive. It's not necessarily cheap either. But uh, but again, uh, you know, they're going to have to acknowledge that housing market weakness and, and what happens to that. Uh, shares are up 10 percent over the past month, though. Uh, you know, we had we had of our our thousand dollar bowtie citizen challenge there on stock card. Hank put it in his uh, put Home Depot in his portfolio and it's up 10 percent. So it's it's helping him out quite a bit there anyway. Uh, next stock here reporting this week, Target. Uh, Target always follows Walmart in its earnings. Uh, it's expected to report earnings on Wednesday. So one day after Walmart fell 31% after its own first quarter earnings uh, last back in May. And of course that was, you know, it fell, it fell when Walmart reported its earnings and it fell when it reported its own earnings as well, right? Because, you know, obviously as goes as goes the uh, the traffic and the shopping at Walmart, it's probably going to go the same way at Target, right? There's very much same uh, you know same customer profile and that kind of thing. So when Walmart reports, Target usually goes the same way uh, that day, and then depending on what it reports the next day on its earnings, it's going to report its earnings uh, on Wednesday. There expectations are for uh, seventy two cents a share, down eighty percent from uh, on a uh, from the same quarter last year on earnings on a three and a half percent revenue growth. So there's uh, there's some there's some things some, some special uh, you know special things there in uh, Target. I think people are, are expecting some kind of a write off of assets and, and stuff because you know you don't get eighty percent eighty percent expectations for eighty percent lower earnings without some kind of a you know special circumstances and that kind of thing. Three and a half percent revenue growth seems a little low to me though. You know, with with all we've seen about companies being able to pass on those higher prices and that inflation uh, to customers, three and a half percent revenue growth seems pretty low, especially if we're, if we're expecting six percent from Walmart. So I think they actually beat. I think they beat on their earn or their revenue um, earnings. You know, depends on what those special circumstances are, but but I think they they have a good chance of beating that as well. You know, those expectations just seem wildly low. Could get a boost from Walmart as if it reports good news on Tuesday, uh, but then again on Wednesday if Target can report better than expected results as well. So so I'd be watching Target here. I think both Target and Walmart have an opportunity to kind of get a relief rally on their earnings because with uh, with expectations so low um, over the past couple of months. Uh, Neo here is, uh, you know, so big electric vehicle maker reports earnings on Thursday, expected to have lost uh, a dollar. Well, uh, you know, CNI uh, Chinese renminbi 1.15 per share uh, versus a loss of just 42 uh, renminbi per share in the, the year ago quarter. So expected to, to, <clears throat> to post greater losses this year. Um, Shares are down 37% for the year, but up 65% from the June low. So we've seen a lot of these electric vehicle stocks, a lot of the growth stocks really rebounding since June. Uh, and, you know, I think I think uh, Neo has a, another good chance of reporting a strong quarter this week. So, again, that's on Thursday. Uh, research from Canalis reported a 63% increase in global electric vehicle sales uh, during the first half of the year. And that's just as, as people saw those record high gasoline prices. Obviously, they're thinking about that shift to uh, two electric vehicles to, to save on those gas prices, right? So again, uh, Canalis reporting 63% increase in global EV sales during the first half of the year. Uh, China dominates that market, okay? Uh, the China EV market is 57% of the global market, right? So more than half of all the electric vehicles sold are in China there. Um, that is obviously NIO's biggest market. It is a domestic company there in China. Um, 
And really, a lot of that is driven by the fact that uh, they're they're able to sell smaller cars, right? They're they're selling some smaller EV uh, electron electric vehicles uh, there in China that that are smaller than allowed to be sold in other markets, right? So there is a lot of very very subcompact uh, cars being sold, EV cars being sold in China as well as some of those other markets, uh, and I think that's going to be good news for Neo on its primary market there. That kind of uh, EV growth through the first uh, first half of the year, and possibly you know through the rest of the year, if we do see gas prices, you know, obviously coming down, but but staying fairly high. Uh, I think I think Neo has a, a good chance to to report some good news tomorrow. Last stock here, then we'll talk about uh, some of the other new stock market news that I'm watching this week, and get to your questions and answers there. Uh, Deer and Company is expected to post a blowout quarter Friday. Your ex expectations here for Deer are for 25% earnings growth on 24% sales growth. So just a an amazing earnings and sales quarter for uh, for Deer expected. Uh, it is interesting that 24% uh, sales growth, 25% earnings growth. So they are expected to be able to pass on pretty much all of their costs. Uh, all of their inflated, inflated costs and higher costs onto uh, on through cut to customers for that 24 24% sales growth and uh, and you know 25% uh, earnings growth. Shares are trading relatively cheaply, 18 times price to earnings. That's about a 17% discount to the long term average of 22 times. Uh, but yeah, I'm just thinking there there could be some kind of limited upside to the stock, right? It hasn't sold off this year with the rest of the market. Uh, shares of Deer, Deer and Company here are up uh, instead of down, you know, instead of down 10, 15 percent like the rest of the market. They're up five percent on the strength in agricultural prices. I'll change this chart here to to that so you can see, yeah, Deer Deer is up for the year, up about five percent, just really on the strength of those commodity prices and, and things like that. So you know, even though it's expected to report a very good uh, quarter, I'm a little worried about what they might say for the rest of the year as far as uh, you know commodities prices coming down, that kind of thing, and, and just you know the the general trend in the stock has been uh, has been overly positive. Uh, so it's still a good good long-term investment, but probably a little limited short-term upside there. Um, <clears throat> next, let's look at the uh, what the sectors did last week. All you out there in the nation know I love to use this uh, this site. Uh, it's the uh, sector select sector spiders. That's sectorspider.com. I'm going to show you that sector tracker there and kind of what uh, what stocks did in the. Uh, in the 11 stock sectors of the economy there last week, give you that big picture idea of, of what the market saw and, and where we might be heading. Uh, all 11 stock sectors did close higher last week, a really strong week, 3.26% up on the, the broader market, the S&P 500 index, uh, and some really big gains. You know, Energy up more than 7% on the rebound in energy prices. Uh, you know, price of oil obviously that took energy stocks higher, but it was really interesting. Some of these other sectors that did better, that outperformed. You've got really economically sensitive stocks, right? Financials, uh, financials is second best, five and a half percent increase last week. Materials and industrials also outperformed. You've got uh, 5.2 percent up on the materials, which is. You know, if you ever want to know what stocks are in each of these sectors, give you kind of an idea of what's in there. You click through there. You've got uh, Albemarle uh, Corporation. So, you know, uh, mining. You got Dow Chemicals, uh, uh, Linden Basil Chemicals. You've got so so basically a lot of mining, a lot of chemicals, a lot of uh, packaging here in the materials sector. Those up 5.2 percent last week. Industrials up 3.9 percent. Just a little bit outperforming the market there at 3.3 uh, percent. And of course, the industrials are uh, a lot of your manufacturers, your factories, transportation, things like that. So it's really interesting that uh, that those did so well. Those cyclical cyclical sectors, those economically sensitive sectors, uh, really kind of buying into the idea that the economy that you know we may be in a recession, we may not be, uh, but even if we do get a recession or if we are one in one, it's going to be extremely mild, right? That's the kind of the idea that investors have. And, and and right now they're saying that you know what uh, if if the economy if the recession if we do get one even if that's going to be very mild then I want to get back into these cyclically uh, sensitive these economically sensitive stocks and so that's why financials materials and industrials are rising doing so well. Uh, now again, you know, if investors are really convinced convinced that the worst of the sell-off is behind us, and again, 
I'm not quite sold on this. I, I think uh, the, the market is getting well ahead of itself, uh, considering the Fed is still raising rates pretty rapidly. Uh, we haven't seen the drop off in the jobs market that we're expecting to see. The housing market is slowing down. So I am expecting the economic slowdown to be a little bit stronger than ex expected. And obviously not a crash, not a huge recession, but a, uh, a little bit a little bit worse than expected. And, and to see that stocks bring, you know, that brings stocks down a little bit more. But if you are convinced, you know, if you do think the sell-off is behind us and, and, and we're in a new bull market, you really should start looking at the sectors that have sold off the most this year, right, on fears of that deeper recession. Uh, so we, do, we did see the, uh, you know, the, the, the cyclical stocks, so materials, industrials, and financials do well last week. But really, if we, if we zoom out here to the year to date, really it's been those like the communication services sector, right, down 23%, the biggest loss so far this year in that communication services sector. And again, that's going to be your telecom companies, so AT&T, Verizon, things like that. But it's also going to be your internet names, your streaming stocks, and your social media platforms. Biggest losses in this, uh, you know, in this consumer or communication services has been those streaming stocks with uh, Netflix. You see down 58% so far this year. Warner Brothers, Walt Disney down 21%, uh, along with the social media stocks like Meta Platforms, right? The old Facebook down 46%. Even Alphabet, so Google, uh, YouTube down 16%. And it's really on that uh, that weakness in ad sales. Okay, well, the weakness in streaming companies really comes from those increasing costs, slower subscriber growth. They're obviously not signing up the you know the the tons, the millions of people's people they were uh, signing up during the pandemic. So that has slowed down a little bit. And uh, and maybe, you know, something that's probably not going to be fixed anytime soon. So I'd be a little bit worried, uh, more wary of the streaming stocks, but the social media stocks, you know, if folks, if you believe that uh, we are going to get a mild recession at worst, uh, and maybe no recession at best, then uh, then you got to believe that the ad spending from a lot of companies is going to come back, right? And that's going to mean that pain in social media stocks over this last, really over the last year, but over the last six months, really, is uh, is going to reverse. Okay, so you really have to start looking at those those platforms like Meta, like Twitter, like uh, you know, like like some of those others, like Alphabet, okay, Google, uh, which owns owns YouTube. Uh, you've really got to start looking at those if that is your thesis that that uh, the, the recession is going to be mild because you know that ad spend spending is down 15, 20 percent on a year over year basis. And, uh, and when that comes back, you know, these stocks are, are cheaper than I've seen them in the last 10 years on a price to sales basis. So you'd, you'd look at those, uh, you'd look at the consumer discretionary sector as well. That one's the, uh, the second, second worst performing sector in the market so far this year, down 16.9%. Uh, and of course, that's going to be your retailers, your uh, auto parts stores, your casinos, your hotels, uh, travel and leisure, things like that. Um, you know, so so those uh, again, uh, you kind of got to got to look at this as at an industry level. Okay, the cruise lines obviously uh, under a mountain of debt and still kind of feeling the pain from from the pandemic a little bit. Uh, but if you do think if you do think the economy is going to come back, then you got to look at these retailers. You got to look at casinos and some of those other discretionary sectors that uh, that are trading at a pretty good uh, pretty good relative value basis and uh, and are ready to rebound on that idea. If we uh, if we kind of zoom out and look at uh, what I'm watching as far as news for the rest of the week, then we'll get to the uh, the question and answer section here. Uh, again, retail companies are really taking center stage uh, this week as well as with retail sales. So we get earnings reports from Walmart as well as Target. Uh, retail stocks just got destroyed last quarter. Remember, uh, remember, Walmart was down something like twenty percent. Target down thirty percent just in a lot, in a couple of days on those inventory issues, on those inflation issues, and and things like that. And, and I think you know it really shocked people and. Uh, you know, set expectations so low that it's really it really lowered the bar for those uh, for those companies for those stocks this quarter. So I think uh, you know I think there's a good chance they they kind of surprise uh, and make those you know surprise make those numbers a little bit more attractive this quarter. So that's always good. Uh, we will see uh, monthly data on retail sales uh, for last month. Now it is expected to be bleak. Uh, retail sales were actually really good the month before. So last month, they're actually uh, expecting just a pay basically flat 0% uh, growth on a year over year or month over month basis for the retail sales. So we are expecting some weakness in retail sales. But again, um, you know, those those expectations for retail companies like Walmart, like Target, like some of those other consumer discretionary stocks are so low that I think it's a, a pretty easy, easy bar to, to, to beat. 
Uh, the other thing I'll be watching this week is really the housing data, data housing market data that we'll, we'll be able to see. Uh, you know, the uh, the National Association of Home Builders is going to report its sentiment index, so kind of what home builders are looking at and, and how how positive they are in the economy. Again, construction just has not kept up with uh, with the housing market. So you know, even if the sentiment is a little bit lower there, I think they're they're still going to be uh, you know making new houses, new new home construction. We get data on uh, new home construction as well, expected to be down to one and a half million on a. Uh, you know, on an annualized pace, uh, that's down from about 1.56 million on the month before. So down a little bit there. Existing home sales, we also get that data this week on Thursday. Expected still again to slow a, show a slowing market down to 4.8 million homes sold on that annualized basis uh, against the 5.1 million in the prior month. So we are again, like we talked about, we are seeing the housing market continue to slow. And of course, you know, what you got to understand here is the housing market usually lags the economy uh, a lot of times, uh, unless it gets so bad that uh, it affects the, the economy. But, you know, you start to see that slowdown in jobs and the rest of the economy that kind of, you know, drags a uh, housing market down to follow. And we are seeing that we are seeing the uh, the housing market slow pretty considerably. Uh, so I want to turn this over to our uh, to our question and answer, you know, always my favorite part of the, uh, you know, of the live stream here, going to Going to scroll up, see what kind of questions we get. If I don't see your question, make sure make sure you use a question mark on the questions there in the uh, in the chat, so I can see that it's a uh, it's a question and and try to address that if I can. Now, obviously, I can't talk uh, a lot about uh, you know individual stocks and funds, all of them, because I, I just don't know, and I'm not going to give you a, a 30 second you know rundown on a stock that I've never looked at. Uh, so you know, Timur Timur wants to know about Cornerstone Tr Strategic Value Fund. I'm sorry, I just I just don't know anything about that company or that stock, and um, wouldn't wouldn't know what to what to be able to tell you. Um, what else we got here though? You think the increase in Okay, so Helder wants to know, do you think the increase in rates by the Fed and decrease on the jobs market, a deeper economic recession will come on the way? If yes, what do you think about its timing? Okay, yeah, so that's really the, the, really the question, right? The, the million dollar question right now is, uh, you know, how far will the, will the Fed go on raising interest rates? How will it affect the economy and the jobs market? And, you know, what, when that comes and what that does for stocks. Right now, again, like I said, the stock market and investors are assuming, are pricing into stocks that the recession is extremely mild. Uh, the jobs market, I think the expectations for the jobs market, for the unemployment rate is only only to be up to like four and a half percent. It's three three point six percent now. It's only expected to rise to four and a half five percent, which would be uh, still fairly low on by historical standards. Um, the the Fed is expected to raise interest rates to about three and a half percent by the end of the year, and really kind of put it on pause there. So. You know, already uh, already about more than halfway through its rate hike cycle. So the uh, obviously over the last four or five weeks, uh, investors are very positive on the economy and, and on stocks. Uh, again, I'm a little skeptical though because we are still seeing that that uh, you know that that weakening housing market, the weakening jobs market, the jobs market will weaken, uh, and. You know, I think the I think the market is just a little ahead of itself. I, I do think you know that starts to come through here in in the third quarter, in the fourth quarter, as we especially as we start getting those third quarter numbers there in October, November, uh, around there. But uh, but there's really not a whole lot of economic data and and kind of stuff to to, to make us believe that you know it, it could change here over the next few weeks. So you know I, I do think you still need to kind of use that barbell strategy right that that we've been talking about that, and that I'm using. You know on one side you have a very high 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 amount of growth stocks and very cyclical very sensitive uh, stocks that are going to follow the market higher. You know if it does keep on going higher. But then sa saving some cash on the uh, on the other side, right? Still having a fairly large allocation of cash. Again, I've I've still got about twenty five percent of my money in cash and cash like investments. You know, just in case we do get better prices, uh, and just in case the economy does fall a little bit more, I would start to reevaluate that. You know, if we go the rest of the year and uh, and stock prices continue to run higher. Then, then I would have to reevaluate and say, okay, you know what? This is a, a new bull market. Okay, if the if the jobs market does weaken, you know, so if the unemployment rate goes up to four percent, right, and, and kind of looks like it's leveling off. If inflation comes down to, uh, I would say, you know, on that on that CPI number comes down to six percent uh, or, or lower. If the core number comes down into the four to five percent range. Um, 
then then I think we I, I think we would get a, a little bit more positive on the market and and that that you know the economy can can get through this. Um, but but until then, uh, I just I just I'm skeptical that uh, you know that the market has seen its worst its worst days. Uh, what else? <clears throat> Okay, uh, Helder from Portugal, good, good to see you there. Thank you, thank you for being here. Uh, Dwayne from Kentucky, great to see everybody here from from all over, all over the Bowtie Nation. Um, Dwayne says switched from Robin Hood to Weeble, best movies made. So yeah, again, you know, look for that link in the uh, in the chat there or in the description below. I'll put it down there and uh, and get your free stocks up. Nothing else. Uh, so you know, it's something, some a way to support the channel without really having to do anything at all. Um, can't you top of the morning? Uh, Ura there, Gilberto. Ura, brother. Uh, what else? Trying to look for questions here again. If you got a question, just uh, ask it in the in the chat there. How much housing market crash in U.S. would impact as well as in Europe? Uh, kind of talked about that through through the uh, through the main topic there. Uh, now it is interesting. It is really interesting to to look at the housing market in some of these other countries. Uh, I've been noticing okay, New Zealand is, is having a huge housing market crash. Uh, Canada actually uh, kind of surprised me talking with some Canadian friends uh, just last couple of weeks, and the, the housing market is much much worse there in Canada. Very much falling uh, into almost a housing market crash. Uh, so it's really interesting following that and and kind of the differences in uh, different national markets even. Okay, uh, but but again, you know, here in the United States and uh, and most countries, you know, Europe, I think uh, the housing market isn't crashing. It's not necessarily as as bad as as bad as it is otherwise. Okay, uh, top tick the housing market. Imagine a resurgence. Can you imagine an uptick resurgence for real estate? Is there a scenario where real estate surges up again? So that's a really interesting question, Dwayne. There, um, you know, an uptick in resurgence. I, you know, I, I don't think. Obviously, the, with asset prices and, and markets, investment markets, it is always that cycle. Okay, so so the 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 better, the higher the higher prices go, you know, the further down they crash. Um, so we have definitely not seen the the, the seen the 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 end to the housing market prices declining again we looked at that Moody's analytics data where uh, you know it's, it's estimated about half of the 400 markets in the United States about half of those will see price declines over the next two years while the other half will see just very slight price increases so you know kind of balancing out there for the overall market they do see the the overall market about 24 percent too expensive which again means if you don't get a crash then you just kind of get a stagnant price growth uh, over the next few years maybe two or three or four percent price growth instead of five or ten percent uh, to really level out those prices and make them not so quite not not so quite expensive on a relative basis so you know, uh, I think it's probably probably kind of a, a slow a slow bleed for the housing market rather than a crash, uh, and, and it's it's hard to see how it really surges back higher again. Um, you know, unless we get some kind of huge stimulus money out of the government or or extremely low rates out of the Fed, then that's what's really going to drive housing market prices. And I just I just don't see it. What's a, one thing that's really interesting, one thing I'm really following, and Joseph kind of talks about this, people can't put their homes for sale and move, that, that they're so overvalued. What's really interesting here is that, okay, so now as interest rates have gone up, you know, interest rates on 30-year mortgages have gone up from 3% to almost 6% in just this year, right? So almost double interest rates uh, on mortgages. Uh, and you know, and house prices have gone up so much that I think a lot of homeowners, they can't sell, they can't move now, okay? Because why would you sell your house? And yeah, you're gonna get pretty good money out of it, but you're just gonna have to buy another house that is so much more expensive, so much more overvalued, and you're gonna get have to get a new mortgage at double the interest rates, right? I think I read, um, I read data uh, last couple of weeks that 70, 70, 70 or eighty percent, seventy or eighty percent of the uh, of homeowners with a mortgage right now uh, have a rate under three percent, right? So you know they can't sell their house. You're pretty much locked in. Uh, you're gonna have to either rent your house or you know just eat it, I guess, if you move because you're gonna be doubling your interest rate. So that's gonna be really interesting as far as what it means for the housing market and the supply of houses on the market. If all these mortgages, all these homeowners, they can't sell, right? Because otherwise they would be basically doubling their interest costs. That's gonna be a really interesting dynamic. I think we're gonna hear more about that over the next couple of years as these interest rates stay high. 
What do you think about Valet? So Victor wants to know about Valet, V-A-L-E. Uh, actually, and it's hard to, hard to remember which one. It, I actually do uh, have that in, a, in an upcoming video. Talked about Valet. Uh, it's one of those good dividend stocks, right? It's uh, one, of the few, one of the few stocks out of Brazil that I would even look at. Uh, but it is it is a good miner. Uh, they've got a strong dividend. It's a sustainable dividend, uh, and that's always important. So yeah, I like I like Valet. I've, I've watched that, and you know, uh, watch the uh, watch the the uh, an upcoming video with that in it. Paul wants to know what's wrong with Intel. What's been wrong with Intel for the last ten years, right? Uh, Intel is just one of the most frustrating and one of the hardest stories to watch, you know, in stocks over the last decade because they used to be the semiconductor company, right? Intel used to be a bellwether stock, one of those stocks that everybody needed in their portfolio and everybody had in their portfolio, and they, they just have been horrible, right? And what you want to watch for, you know, it's really a lesson for investors for a lot of these tech companies, you know, tech companies, especially semiconductor companies, any any company where that that innovation edge is really their, their entire competitive advantage. Uh, you have to look at how much they're spending on research and development. And, and you can get that from, let me go ahead and show you in, uh, you know, show you, show you real time here. We can look at, uh, well, let's look at Intel, INTC. And if you go to, uh, go to the stock, stock, the stock chart on these, and I'll just use Yahoo Finance here because it's free and available. If you go to the financials, and you go to their income statement. So their income statement, that's going to report all the uh, the revenue. It's going to start off with the revenue, the sales they made over the last quarter, over the last year. It's going to cost of revenue, gross profits. And then in this operating expenses here, they're going to report research and development. Okay, so this is one of the probably, if not the most important, one of the most important lines you want to look for in tech companies, in these companies where that innovation edge is so important. You want to look, you want to track how much they're spending on research and development, right? And what we saw, what the warning sign was really for Intel is, you know, back 10 plus years ago, they used to spend upwards of 20 and 30 and 40 percent of their sales uh, on research and development. They used to constantly push most, you know, almost half of their sales of their revenue back into research and development to, re to to develop those new chips and really stay ahead so far ahead of all the other semiconductor companies. Well, what we saw after uh, after really the bubble burst after in two thousand two two thousand three they really had kind of a regime change in that and started spending way less on their research and development and, and it cost them. You know they fell behind in that innovation and they've never been able to take it back. Okay. You know, the AMD has really been the benefit of, uh, you know, so advanced micro devices have really benefited the most from the fall in Intel. They've really picked up the slack. They've increased their research and development spending, uh, you know, and, and have really taken that innovation edge. In fact, a bug in the, uh, the latest version of Intel's uh, data center uh, chips. They had a really bad bug in the the chips that they sell to data centers. Uh, that is that is actually allowed AMD to pick up a lot of market share in its data center business because because again, Intel dropped the ball on its research and development, had a bug in one of their chips, and, and lost a lot of business on that. So, you know, not so much uh, about Intel. Uh, I I think they you know they 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 stand to benefit from this. Uh, chip bill that's going that went through Congress, right? The uh, the funding for for semiconductor domestic sem semiconductor companies they stand to gain from that. But I would still I think I would still go for AMD. They've got the competitive advantage. They've got the innovation edge, and and they're really picking up market share where Intel is losing it. So I would look at Intel AMD instead of Intel. Uh, you know, Intel is extremely cheap, you know, on a relative basis versus some of these other country companies, but, but it's because, you know, the stock price is really going nowhere. Uh, what else? Uh, do you have confidence in the job the Federal Reserve is doing? Okay, so Jamie, Jamie, Jamie uh, wants to know if, if I think the Fed is doing a good job. And you know what? I actually do think they're doing a pretty decent job. You know, uh, you can you can kind of gauge the the job the Fed is doing by the reaction to their to their meetings and to those interest rate increases and all that. Because if the Fed is doing a good job, it kind of you know through its uh, through its speeches from, by the Fed members, all that it really previews what they want to do and what they're going to do, right? So you don't get those big shocks and those big uh, stock market sell offs and things like that when they do raise rates and and have their meetings and things like that. And, and of course, we just we haven't seen that uh, you know for for at least more than. Year. So they have done a good job of kind of previewing what they're going to do, what they're thinking as far as rates, where they're going to raise rates, 
And they've tried to kind of balance out the stock market, the enthusiasm and things like that uh, by economists and by the rest of the market. You know, you'll notice, you know, right now they're still they're trying to be a little bit more hawkish, right? The the investors in the stock market is saying, okay, you know, big relief rally. Uh, we think the Fed is going to start slowing down on rates from here, uh, start slowing down those rate increases and really kind of take it easy, take a wait and see approach on interest rates. Well, now the Fed is coming out and kind of trying to balance that with saying, hold on here. You know, the, the jobs market is still very strong. Inflation is still very high. We are still going to have to raise rates and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe faster than expected. So they're trying to balance those expectations, kind of let the market down slowly if they do have to raise rates faster than expected. So they're doing a fairly good uh, job right now. Now, obviously, the Fed just dropped the ball tremendously over the last couple of years. There is no reason why we needed, uh, you know, zero rates, rates at zero for so long, uh, especially when the government was just pushing so much money out in the economy. The Fed was pushing so much money out in the economy through its bond buying programs and things like that. We didn't need 0% interest rates for so long, and they just really ignored inflation. So really, they're, they're having to kind of make up for it now, of course. Okay, how often or when will companies issue warnings or change guidance between normal reporting times? Uh, you know, it's it's fairly rare. Uh, I mean, usually the usually they warn uh, two weeks, two or three weeks before the uh, the the quarter. Uh, there's really no set schedule. Uh, so you know, Danielle wants to know how often how often companies issue warnings. Uh, we have seen uh, obviously warnings. Uh, you know, this this quarter and last. Uh, but they haven't really they haven't really come out you know pre warning mostly it's it's been mostly during the earnings reports uh, and I think investors are starting to expect it starting to expect uh, companies to issue warnings on their outlook over the next com couple of quarters so there's really no there's no reason to do it uh, you know before before earnings come out I don't know how much debt drill power Fed have raised rates wouldn't the just payment on U.S. debt become so high okay so Helder wants to know taking into account U.S. federal debt uh, how much Freedom, Jerome Powell, and the Fed has to raise more rates for the rest of the year. And this, that's a big question. You know, a lot of people are saying that the Fed can't really raise rates that much uh, just because, yeah, uh, debt is so high. Federal debt is so high. Debt, you know, the, the debt to GDP is so high. Um, they can't raise rates because, you know, it would just send the, the economy uh, into a tailspin and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, the thing is, you know, I mean, rates are just still so low compared to historical uh, averages. Um we can actually look at uh, you know look at that on the uh, on the Fed here. Uh, so we look at you know ten year Treasury rates. And uh, market yield ten year Treasury constant maturity minus federal funds rate. Let's look at that one. Okay, so you, I mean you can see uh, minus the federal funds rate. So the the amount the ten year interest rate is above that Fed rate, right? The, the, the rate the Federal Reserve sets is still histor historically low. I mean, it's only half a percent here uh, above that. Uh, and that's really, you know, the 10-year Treasury rate. That's really the, the model, the benchmark rate for a lot of other interest rates for, uh, you know, mortgages, things like that. And, uh, and obviously, you know, government debt uh, on that. And that's only half a percent above the federal funds rate. You can see for most of, you know, this, is, this goes back to 2018. So, but for most of that time, it's been 1% or more over the federal funds rate. We can go see if they've got max longer. Okay, so we got till 1962 here. And, you know, often it's, been, it's at 2.5% above the Fed, Fed funds rate. So, you know, even though interest rates have come up, they're expected to go up even further. Uh, they're still historically, you know, pretty, pretty low his, by historical standards. So I think, you know, the Fed doesn't really have to worry about bumping up against the ceiling, you know, for uh, for slowing down the economy too much or uh, or the federal debt, uh, that kind of thing. OK, uh, Lowe's. Lowe's actually. So Dwayne wants to know about Lowe's. Uh, they actually do report. Uh, I think they report earnings this week as well. Didn't cover that because we covered Home Depot. And, and I mean, basically, I think you're going to hear the same story from Lowe's as you do from Home Depot. Uh, you're going to see that, uh, you know, that the housing market is slowing down. They're probably going to warn uh, on, on the next few quarters, just that kind of that uncertainty in the, in the housing market. So with these home improvement retailers, you've not only got uncertainty in the housing market, but also uncertainty in those costs, right? In Inflation, as far as wages, as far as uh, you know, supplies, things like that, that that they may not be able to pass on all those costs to customers. So you've got really kind of double uncertainty on those uh, both of those stocks, and and both of them have done well uh, this year relative to the rest of the market. So again, you know, I, I think there's just limited upside in those uh, in some of those home improvement retailers. 
What else do we have? Wondering how much midterm elections in November will be affecting stocks. Uh, so Melanie, Melanie wants to know about uh, midterm e elections uh, effect on stocks, uh, as well as f flu and cold season starts. A uh, new strain of COVID emerges. That's uh, I mean obviously those those are big kind of blacks. Well, not necessarily the elections, but but the flu and cold season and, and another COVID strain is, is really kind of those black swan events that we can't know about, right? Um, now one thing one thing that is interesting is. You know, really, the the uh, the the prevalence of cold, flu, and cold kind of is tied to uh, you know what it was the years before, right? Because you build up, we build up immunities and resistance to uh, to the, to the strains of the flu and cold. So, if not a lot of people had flu and cold the year before or the year before that, then you kind of get a weakening of resistance to those, and we tend to see higher, you know, worse worse epidemics or, or worse seasons uh, for flu and cold coming up. And, and of course, you know, uh, a year ago, we were still kind of wearing masks, right? We we're still kind of social distancing. So we could see a, a pretty bad flu and cold season this year, um, just starting up. I think that starts in October, something like that. A new strain of COVID is really interesting that we haven't seen more strains of COVID, uh, that we haven't seen more outbreaks of that. But but obviously, you know, that is uh, that's a, that's another kind of uh, worry that we have right there. Uh, as far as midterm elections, you know, I don't I don't I don't know that it really affects it that much. I can see. I, I'm, I've been watching the social media stocks again, like we talked about earlier. If you do believe that uh, the worst of the sell-off is over, that the worst of the uh, the economy weakening is pretty much over, that the economy won't weaken into a deep recession, then you got to look at those social media stocks, right? Because that ad revenue is going to come back, uh, and you know, tied to that with the midterm elections, you know, I think you're obviously going to start seeing. Uh, spending, ad spending for you know for the elections ramp up here in the next couple of months, uh, and that that, that has a uh, the potential to help some of those social media stocks, right? You know, get more of that ad spending, get those ad rates back up a little bit higher as the competition heats up for uh, for for elections. So that that's something you might want to look for, uh, look at uh, as far as social media stocks. You know, if they can get a slight bump here in the third quarter, I guess it would be it would be their third quarter uh, where the ad rates would go up a little bit more and, and start seeing the election uh, spending ramp up there. Uh, you know, as far as after after the elections, uh, that's you know that's going to be a, a little bit harder because you know just trying to predict where where the elections actually go. We are expecting you know a divided a divided house uh, or a divided uh, Congress and divided administration. So obviously the Democrats will still hold the White House for another two years. Uh, the uh, Republicans are widely widely expected to take the House and maybe the Senate. So if we do get uh, kind of divided, that's usually good for stocks, right? Because that kind of gridlock, that, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, gridlock that where, where nothing much gets done, it, it means Washington's out of the way of business. Okay, so um, so that's generally good for, for stocks anyway. So after the election, you know, if it does look like it's kind of a divided, a divided government, then uh, then that could be good news for, for stocks. Uh, party. So Matisse, Matisse Eyewear. Uh, good to see you there. Uh, I think I just lost your comment. Something about financials. I'm sorry there. Uh, yep, here we go. I'm looking carefully for short term investment grade corporate bonds selling at discount prices. Um, what was the other question? I thought I think I missed a question there by Matisse. Sorry about that. These this this chat is just super, you know, super. Uh, there we go. Banks are having a party. A one and a half percent deal with Citibank for a margin interest. They doubled it to three percent. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm looking at. I'm you know, you know, I've been looking at banks all year. I think uh, again, one of the uh, one of the other sectors you need to watch is the financials. If you do think that the the worst of the sell-off is over, if you do do think the economy isn't going to get any worse, because all these banks, City City Group, uh, J P Morgan, Wells Fargo, they've all moved tens of billions of dollars from their income statement, from their earnings, onto that what if count uh, account for loan loss reserves, right? So again, just like we saw in the pandemic, where they moved those tens of billions onto that, uh, you know, really killed their earnings. I think earnings were down something like 30, 40% on a year over year basis uh, here in the first half of the year for the banks, because they were moving all that money onto that what if that cash balance account. Uh, just like in the pandemic, though, if we don't see that happen, if loan defaults don't increase, if the recession doesn't get any worse, then, uh, then they're going to have all that money that they can move then back into earnings 
increase their earnings. Uh, we saw 2021, I think, uh, you know, last year, 2020, 2021 was uh, just huge for, for the financials, for the bank stocks, uh, one of the best performing sectors because of that, because they then started moving that cash back onto their income statement and increasing their earnings unexpectedly. Uh, so I think, you know, if you do believe that, that the economy isn't going to get any worse, then you got to believe that the banks are going to come roaring back. A lot of those very cheap uh, Goldman Sachs, cheapest that I've seen it in 10 years, uh, JP Morgan, and still cheap on a relative basis. A lot of those bank stocks doing uh, doing really well. Uh, uh, you consider FCX, Freeport McMoran, best stock to be exposed to copper valuation. Uh, now, uh, there's a couple of different ideas there. Okay, so FCX, Freeport McMoran, you know, one, if not the largest uh, miner in the world, one of the largest. Um, now. If it's if you're saying best stock exposed to copper valuation, meaning you know if copper goes up, it's going to go up the best. Pro no, I, I mean you're going to look at if you think copper prices are going to go up, you're going to want to go with some of the smaller, some of the smaller, more uncertain, more risky miners, right? Because you know they're going to have a little bit more leverage, a little bit more risk in their stock, so they're going to go up higher. It's the same thing with uh, with oil oil companies and shale drillers and things like that. You don't look at Exxon or Chevron for those big gains. Uh, if, if uh, you know, oil prices go up, you see things like Marathon and things like, uh, you know, uh, Fang, which is Diamondback Energy, or Devon, you know, those go up most because they're a little bit more riskier, they're a little bit more focused on that shell play, things like that. So as far as copper, uh, you know, you would want to look at companies with a, a little bit more uh, like Southern Copper, which is in Chile and, and, uh, and Peru in there. So a little bit riskier uh, mine profile, things like that. Those would probably go up the most. Now, uh, if the question is, do you think, do I think FCX is one of the best plays on copper prices and the best long-term plays in mining? Yes, I think it is. Uh, and I think the reason with that is because with FCX, you've got a much larger mine profile, much more globally uh, exposed mine profile. So it's not quite as focused in, uh, you know, in Mexico, Chile or Peru or things like that, you know, the little bit, little bit riskier markets there. Uh, so, so you've, you've got a much more diversified, much less risky uh, mine profile. You've got obviously the size and that scale advantage, things like that. So I think FCX is just a good overall bet on, on copper prices, especially for the longer term. You know, we, we are seeing, especially those EV sales, that's something we haven't talked about, but you know, if you combine some of the stuff that we're seeing with that Canalys, uh, you know, that the, the Canalys uh, report that 63% increase in electric vehicle sales over the first half of the year. Uh, and what we also know that electric vehicles use three times more copper in the vehicle than a traditional car, right? A combustion engine car. If you take those and put those together, then you've got a pretty strong picture for copper prices, right? A pretty strong picture for copper, not just, you know, this first half, which should be really good, but, you know, obviously out in the future as electric vehicle sales just, just continue to increase. Uh, so, so yeah, I like FCX. I like that copper story uh, on electric vehicles and that kind of thing. Uh, what is your take on automotive and airline stocks? So Kenny Scott wants to know about automotive and airline stocks. Okay, two different things, obviously. Uh, automotive stocks, I, I actually kind of like the, the legacy providers, right? Uh, Ford, GM, you know, we've seen a huge sell-off this year from those EV uh, raised prices, right? So Ford and GM really had huge years last, huge years last year uh, as far as returns on their stock prices. That's come way off. Uh, so I think... You know, uh, while the uh, while the the EV bet on those prices has come off, the EV future has not. You know, those companies, the the legacy automakers like Toyota, like GM, like like Ford, uh, still have a future in electronic in electric vehicles. I keep saying electronic vehicles, electric vehicles. They still have a very good future in those, and and are going to see those revenues and those earnings increase. Uh, but you know, you don't have the valuation uh, impact on there. So so I think those the relative values are still very good on there. Those obviously, you know, we talked about Neo earlier. I think they're going to have a very good quarter when they report this week, uh, especially on those rise of uh, rise in EV sales in China. Uh, so yeah, I, I like the I like the automotive stocks here. Uh, airline stocks, airline stocks are tough, you know, because airlines like uh, like cruise lines, they just put on so much debt over the past couple of years to survive the pandemic. Now it's it's kind of like a hangover, right? They are seeing the debt hangover right now. Uh, the cruise lines especially, you know, so much debt that they're going to have a tr they're going to have trouble meeting those interest payments. Uh, you know, a lot of these are, are zombie companies not making enough money to to even cover their interest payments. Uh, 
And what we see in airline stocks, you know, I mean, the airlines are just in a mess, okay? Uh, we just flew to Bogota and Avianca uh, just this last week to get my daughter's visa so we can make that move to Tampa. Uh, you know, Avianca, the whole airport was a mess, but Avianca actually, Avianca so, declared bankruptcy a couple years ago because they were such a mess. But, you know, you see in the domestic American Airlines, United, Southwest, all of those, they're canceling flights uh, and they just can't get a control of their their wages uh, as well as their, their labor and that, that kind of thing. Uh, so I would be wary of the airline stocks, okay? You know, um, it's one of those things that if you can trade it, then you can make some money. But as a long-term bet, I, I would avoid them, definitely. Okay. Uh, what is your thought on investing in tangible assets? Hmm. Connor's got a cool question here. Uh, what is your thoughts on investing in tangible assets, such as baseball mem memorabilia for long-term? Um, Kind of two ideas there. Uh, so, so real assets, tangible assets, um, something you, every investor needs, right? Uh, especially when inflation is so high. And I think going to be long, higher and longer than people expect, okay? There is no way inflation is coming back down to like 2%, you know, in the next three years like the Fed expects, like a lot of economists expect. Just isn't going to happen. Um, so if you are looking at longer term inflation, then then you need those real assets that are going to keep up with that. Things like real estate, things like, uh, you know, things we'll talk about there. But... Um, but that's really different from, you know, baseball memorabilia, comic books, uh, art, uh, some of that other stuff is really kind of a different animal, right? You really have to know about how to invest in those and, and things like that. Um, and, and I think with those, you really have to get more of an intrinsic, uh, intrinsic re reward from those than the monetary reward, uh, because, you know, it's, it's hit or miss a lot of times on those baseball, on, you know, collectibles, or, or, right, we'll call them collectibles and art. Uh, you really have to have fun with it uh, and, and get that kind of a value too, because, you know, what we see is really the long-term returns on those, uh, you know, aren't, aren't aren't as good as, you know, just putting your money in stocks and, and things like that. So, you know, yes, for, for real assets like real estate and things that keep up with inflation, uh, if you if you do enjoy collecting baseball cards or, or comics or, or art or anything like that, if you can get that intrinsic reward that adds to that longer-term re reward, then I think, I mean, that's definite. That's, that's obviously uh, something you want to go for. How would you invest in REITs right now? So real estate investment trusts. Uh, you know, the REITs are mostly commercial property, so not quite seeing quite the sell-off that we're seeing in the housing market. Uh, you know, a, a couple of a couple of those that I still like long-term, you know, self-storage is really expensive right now. I And what we can do is if we're talking about REITs, let's go to... Uh, Let's go to the NAREIT page. If you type in Google NAREIT, so that's N-A-R-E-I-T, uh, you know, we'll lo look at uh, uh, sector returns, returns, see if we can get it through there. Okay, so, yep, you type in NAREIT sector returns in Google and you get this first one, performance by property se sector subsector. Okay, this is a really great resource. It's I think it's a monthly report that they put out. Uh, through the NAREITs so of the National Association of REITs, uh, monthly research they do on each sector of the uh, of the REITs. Okay, so each property type, uh, if you want to call it, and it's a really good a really good way to kind of get a, a feel for uh, what REITs are doing, what the different property types are doing, because that's really what you got to look at when you're when you're investing in REITs. Um, you know which ones are are maybe expensive right now, and you might might want to avoid them for a little bit. Which ones uh, maybe offering opportunities? So you know we've seen. Uh, so here we've got the 2022 year-to-date returns through July. So the first half, first half 2022, the the returns on these. Uh, you know, so all all REITs uh, in that index are down 12%. So the REITs have not had a great year this year. Obviously, with interest rates going up, you know that that raises the cost of owning real estate or, or borrowing to, to buy real estate. So that's that's weighed on the REITs. Uh, and you can look at okay, so Office down 21%, and I think Office Office is probably one of the one of the better uh, opportunities I would watch for. If if you think people are going to get back to the office office and uh, and you think the valuations are a little bit lower there, then that 22% uh, sell off in Office REITs I think is is a little overdone. Uh, you know, residential, so apartments, uh, apartments manufactured in single family, down 15%, down almost 15% so far this year. Uh, what else we got? We got self-storage is actually giving back some of its gains. Self-storage, we started out the year, you know, I did a, a REITs for 2022 video and self-storage was the only one that I wouldn't touch. Uh, you know, the self-storage returns for self-storage stocks has had gone up so much. Um, well, you can see here for 2021, they were up 79%. Right. So, you know, you've got things like um, 
self storage. I uh, uh, what what are some a couple of those? Uh, uh, you know, it escapes me. What's the the self storage shop? PSA, right? Public uh, PSA is public sector. Public PSA. What is that? Public storage. There you go. Public storage. Uh, some of the other competitors there. Uh, see if it'll load here. Uh, so you got uh, public storage, extra space storage, EXR. You've got uh, you know extra space. You've got Pro Load, Cube Smart, Cube. Uh, so all of those. All of those self storage stocks just boomed last year, 79% last year, uh, and, and down 12% this year because you know they are still very expensive on that long term valuation basis. So I would I would continue to avoid self storage. Uh, healthcare, you know, healthcare only up 16% last year. Uh, REITs in general, REITs overall up very good last year, 41% last year. So you kind of look at you know healthcare was only up 16%. I think uh, you know the ho the hospitals. Uh, really had to take it, uh, take it on the chin through the pandemic. They had to, you know, cut their elective surgeries. They had to cut a lot of the high margin services that they do to triage those uh, those pandemic patients. Uh, they just started coming off of that last year. I think they still have, you know, a ways to go in that. Obviously, demographics are very good for the healthcare sector, um, you know, for the services and all that. So I do like the healthcare uh, as a long term bet. You know, infrastructure and uh, and data centers, data centers especially, data centers hit especially hard this this year. Obviously, in the slowdown in IT spending, uh, just as well as just general valuation. So, data centers, obviously, a, a lo good long term play, and I think it's starting to get you know close to a, a good valuation here with the eighteen percent sell off in data centers this year. Then I think that's something that that you can start looking at again and, and saying you know that's a good long term value, a good long term place to to get in right now. So just uh, you know, again, uh, again, just go to the NAREIT page, uh, and it's going to be this uh, investment performance by property sector and subsector. Great monthly report. You can follow uh, follow all the the sectors or all the property types in REITs to kind of get a feel for what the uh, what the REIT market is doing. Uh, it's always going to hold cash like. So Michael, Michael says hospitality in Southern Florida, South Florida uh, before COVID was always granted to halt cash like investment. You know, it's, it's interesting uh, joining some, some various Tampa, Tampa related Facebook groups and, and that, and in one of them, I noticed, uh, I mean, like every other post is a new business shutting down. So I kind of wonder about, uh, about that and the, you know, the real economy, the real economy uh, versus what we see reported on the news and all that, uh, you know, why is, uh, why are all these shops, and maybe it's just, you know, maybe it's Tampa, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's just the people on the for on the group, uh, you know, a little bit more pessimistic and, and posting all those closures and, and all that. So maybe it's, you know, maybe it's just kind of a bias there, but uh, really interesting how, yeah, a lot of, a, a lot of businesses shutting down there. So, so maybe the economy is a little bit softer than, than we, we expect it. Uh, t -t -t political situation or teetering. What else? Looking for uh, again. You know, if you ask a question, please use a question mark so I can see it real quick. What do you think about Block? So Junaid wants to know about Block, uh, the old square, right? Ticker SQ. Uh, you know, I, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of Block uh, just because I like PayPal a little bit better, uh, and I think Block has really come off of its, uh, you know, off of its core advantages, off of its core competencies in, you know, payments and things like that to to focus. A little bit too much on the blockchain and cryptocurrencies and things like that, right? Jack Dorsey has gone all in, wild crypto maniac, uh, and you know, changing the name of the company even, uh, and really changing the focus in that company. So I think it was a great payments company. It had a lot of a uh, lot of upside on the digital wallet that it has there, and you know, a lot of future on that. But they they've just since changed. So. I think you're in block if you really like, you know, not only the digital payment side and uh, and that kind of thing, but if you, you know, you want you want a cryptocurrency investment as well, you know. If so if you want to combine the two, I say you go with block. If you just like digital payments and that kind of industry and the future in that, I think you got to go with PayPal uh, instead. I, I think PayPal is is really doing well. Uh, we saw activist invest, investor pressure on them over the last couple of weeks that have driven the stock price up, and I think you have to look at that uh, instead. For investors outside, what do you think about the best place to have cash on the bench, getting visible return meanwhile? Okay, so Helder wants to know about uh, outside investing outside the U.S. for visitors. 
or for investors outside the U.S. where to have cash. Um, I, I'm sorry, that's that's a that's a tough one because I really don't cover you know outside the U.S. Uh, investments. If you, I would look at some kind of government savings bonds. If the government, you know, best places to have cash, uh, I think you got to look to uh, some of the safety sectors, some of the safety stocks. So uh, you know, energy. I think energy stocks. Uh, they have come down a little bit with the energy prices, but something we've been talking about on the channel lately is, you know, Putin has no no reason to negotiate. Russia has no reason to negotiate an end to the Ukraine conflict until well into the winter. Okay, because that is their entire their entire leverage, their entire uh, you know leverage in the negotiations is uh, you know is on those oil prices and, and its effect on or Europe's dependency on Russian natural gas and oil okay so that's only going to get stronger through the through the winter through January February uh, so I don't think that we see any kind of negotiations any kind of positive direction on Ukraine until well into probably January February uh, and, and so that means oil prices are going to continue to be higher and uh, you know and, and you're gonna get you're gonna get pretty good returns on those energy stocks as well as the cash dividends and things like that. Okay, uh, so Lifters, Lifters Gym, Chad, Chad over there at Lifters Gym up there in North Carolina says, if someone is wanting to invest right now, what's the best and safest place to invest when you have possibility of recession at the same time, possibility of setting up for a bull market? Again, you know, I got I got to go to that with that barbell strategy. Okay, and this is this has saved my ass. Okay, I got to I'll be honest with you, folks, all you out there in the nation know, I'm very skeptical of this of this bull bull market of the rally over the last five weeks. Um, you know, I, I, I've been calling for it to, to come off. Uh, stocks are expensive, you know, on a short term technical basis, you know, on that RSI. Um, so if I hadn't didn't wasn't using that barbell strategy, I would have been screwed, right? Because I would have been in over safe stocks, I would have been, you know, uh, in cash and things like that. But because I'm using that barbell strategy, where I do have a, a good portion in growth stocks in very much uh, high beta names, right? So those growth stocks, Teladoc, SoFi, PayPal, uh, you know, even some of the meme stocks, things like that, uh, you know, the stocks that that really jump with the, uh, you know, th that do much better uh, with the, than the market. Uh, you know, you have a, a big portion of those, but then you know that cash set aside and, and those safety stocks, and really nothing in the middle. I mean, you can't be you can't be middle of the road with that strategy. Okay, uh, you know, you, you get you stand on one side of the road, you're safe. You stand on the other side of the road, you're safe too. You stand in the middle of the road, you're going to get ran over. Okay, so if you try to if you try to combine that barbell approach with like value investing, with dividend stocks, with things like that, and have too much in those, then it's just going to be kind of a middle of the road uh, return for you. But what you can do, again, barbell strategy. You have those growth stocks on one end, you have the cash and cash like investments on the other to protect your money and you really get the best of both worlds. Uh, now, obviously you're not going to get you're not you're not going to get as high a return if you had it all in growth stocks, but then, you know, if the rally does fall apart, then you're not you're, you're not going to get hurt as bad either and you're going to have that cash set aside to take advantage of the the lower prices. What else? Uh, sign up for Weeble. So Brandon says he signed up for Weeble. I appreciate that, man. Yeah, sign up. Deposit one penny. I mean, that's the thing. I think a lot of people they they say they don't trust Weeble. It's a you know Chinese company. It's actually based in the United States. They got headquarters in New York, um, and they don't trust it. They don't want to use it. They don't need another platform. Whatever. Uh, but it's free. Basically, you, you you deposit one penny. You get all those free stocks. Uh, you let them sit there for a little bit because there is kind of a, a time limit, I think, that you have to hold them in there. But then you sell them and move the cash out. You know, it's free cash. So it's it's hard to beat. Hard to beat that. Okay. What's uh, remote healthcare? Heard you spending about TDoc and what about hims and hers? Uh, Helder wants to know about uh, T Doc and Hims and Hers. Really don't don't know anything about Hims and Hers. Uh, I, I assume it's a remote healthcare company, uh, virtual healthcare. Uh, in that space, you know, I, I mean, I know uh, Amazon just recently bought uh, on me on media or on healthcare, right? The the other the other virtual healthcare uh, company in that space. So a little bit more competition for Teladoc, but but you know, if we get right down to it, Teladoc just has a, an an undeniable advantage in virtual healthcare in that space. Uh, it's a great long-term company. They're still expecting 20% year-over-year sales growth for for many years from now, uh, and, and I think the valuation is really strong on the company. So I'm I'm still on Teladoc. That's the only one I'm looking at for for virtual healthcare. Really, um, potential downside. Is there any way to meantime see so you cash? 
the cash doesn't lay in there. Okay, so Ahmed, Ahmed says, uh, yeah, he's building up his cash position uh, just just in case the stocks do come off. Uh, but is there any way to just you know not just let the cash sit there, right? Uh, <clears throat> You know, it's, it, and, and I know it sucks to, to let cash sit there and think that you're not making any money. You're actually losing money to inflation. Uh, I, I would kind of resist the temptation a little bit. I mean, there are some things you can do, and, and, and I'll tell you what those are. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I think we, 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 see, we see lower prices if we do within this next six months, right? So six months is not a long time to sit on cash. Uh, even if it's as much as 15, 20%, especially if you have those growth stocks on a barbell strategy, you're still going to see an upside in the market. Um, so it's not a long time just to sit on the cash. What you can do also, though, if you just you just can't resist the temptation, you don't want that cash to sit there, is you can do something like do like a cash secured, uh, uh, you know, put writing strategy, right? And, and this is basically you uh, you sell puts on uh you know, on, on stocks that you would want to buy. Okay, so you, so you you sell puts on those. Uh, if the stock market continues to rise, then uh, then those those aren't executed. You don't buy the stocks. Nothing happens. You keep the premium from the puts. Um, you know, if the stock market does fall and you needed that cash, well then <clears throat> you've got the cash set aside, but you've got the puts uh, as well. And basically, you just you just buy in at those. So you know, you you look at cash secured puts. Uh, strategy you can buy in so so take maybe a, a 20 percent discount to the SPY to the S&P 500 index uh, and, and buy the puts or sell the puts on that that means you're collecting that premium uh, that cash is earmarked for that just in case stock prices come down and then you're in at that level so just something else to, to use with your cash where it's not quite just sitting there it is earning a return on that premium that you sold those puts for <clears throat> Uh, Blue C, how about Lucy IPO? Really couldn't tell you anything about that. You know, I mean, I, I know we have seen some crazy things happening with IPOs, especially like Chinese stock IPOs. That that AMTD that that just exploded like 300 times higher uh, on its IPO just uh, you know last month. Um, so I mean, we've seen some crazy stuff with with IPOs with uh, the bankruptcies. You know, I think. Uh, uh, the 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 Revlon right filed for bankruptcy and its shares went up like eightfold over the next couple of days after it filed bankruptcy. So we've seen some real weird weird crazy trading on uh, on some of these things. Uh, but but it's really hard to say you know which stock is going to do that kind of thing. So I think it's you know if if you want to play with two percent of your money, two percent of your portfolio, five percent of your portfolio in these high risk trading kind of ideas, then do that. But I would definitely limit it to no more than five, three, five percent of your entire portfolio, your entire net wealth, uh, right? Because you know these are extremely high risk, high, uh, uh, high risk kind of ideas. Uh, <clears throat> Antonio wants to know about short term investment in Mosaic. Uh, you know, I, I I don't think I would do short term. And I, I mean, I think it's a good long term stock, a mosaic, uh, some of these uh, CF, you know, CF for industries, the other fertilizer company there. Um, some of those other fertilizer companies, you know, they've got great long term trends, uh, you know, and prices uh, for, for fertilizer prices, things like that. So I would look at it more as a long term, a short term, you know, short term, it's all about investor sentiment and, uh, and, and, you know, unexpected news, news that you really can't know until it happens. So, so it's a, it, you know, it's tough for, for that. Uh, R, R wants to know about Microsoft or Google. Uh, Microsoft is still very expensive, it seems. You know, if you look at Microsoft, we could look at, you know, the, the uh, Microsoft here in Yahoo, and you'll see what I see. You'll see what I mean. You know, they have done very well on revenue growth over the last couple of years. But if you look here in uh, the statistics tab on, uh, on Yahoo Finance for Microsoft, you look at the price to sales. And this price to sales of 11 times. I mean, that is growth stock. That is huge growth stock territory. Okay, so, I mean, if you're looking at investing in Microsoft, you are paying 11 times on a price to sales basis, uh, which is extremely high. We could actually look at... Um, we can actually see kind of how high that is on a relative basis over over the stock's history. I'll go here to uh, Morningstar, and I'll get the, the the premium account so you can see we'll we'll be able to see over 10 years. And if you look here, and now I mean you know I like Microsoft as a company. I like it. Uh, you know, I, I won't say I like it as a stock because I don't. It's just so overvalued. Uh, but I like it as a company. They are doing great in their cloud business. That's really holding them up. But at this, you know, at this price, 11 times. So if you see here, um, let's see if we can expand this a little bit. 
Okay, so if you see on a price to price to sales basis, it's trading at 11 times. Now that is, you know, just only slightly above the five year average, 9.76. So, you know, maybe about 10% over the five year average there. But, uh, you know, if you look further out, I mean, it's been as low as seven times in 2018, uh, you know, seven times in 2017. Really, we had that we had that shift here from 2018 to 2019, where the, uh, you know, basically the, the tech stocks in general just kind of took off there those last couple of years, 2019, 2020, really re-rated higher. Now, so the thing you have to worry about is do tech stocks like Microsoft come back down to these longer term valuations, these valuations we saw in 2012 through 2017 here. So you see 2012 started at three times on a price to sales basis, started, you know, just gradually crept up five times in 2015, seven times in 2017. So if it, if it uh, you know, if we get a re-rating back down to uh, seven, even seven times on a price to sales basis, that would be, you know, compared to right now, 11 times. So seven, uh, four, that'd be, you know, that what would be, that'd be about 30% downside on the stock if it re-rated down to, you know, seven, seven, seven times on a price to sales basis. So I don't know, you know, I, I mean, all you out there in the nation know that, uh, 10 is really kind of my cutoff for growth stocks as far as 10, 10 times on that price to sales basis. I hate paying more than that. Uh, and we saw it saved my ass, you know, last year when those growth stocks like Teladoc and SoFi and all those companies that I really like long term were trading at way insane valuations. You know, I didn't buy because they were they were trading at those insane valuations. Right. And we've seen those come down 60, 70, 80 percent since then. So I think you really have to draw a line in the sand with some of these tech stocks with growth stocks and say, you know what? No, I'm going to wait for it to come down down at least under 10 times on a price to sales basis is just too expensive right now. Even though Microsoft is a good company, uh, I, I think you wait, you know, I, I think you, you got to worry about that. Google, I, I really like Google uh, Alphabet there. Uh, same reasons I, I like Amazon, right? You know, it's it's got a really strong position. It's uh, it's the sum of parts, I think is more valuable than than the, the whole company, right? And what I mean here is Google, obviously, it owns YouTube, it owns uh, Waymo, you know, the uh, the self driving unit, it owns a lot of other things besides just that search, right? And all those companies, if they were forced to separate, or if they did separate, I think would be worth much more than than what that stock is worth right now is what it's trading for right now. So I think, you know, Google, you're, you're basically you're paying for the search, uh, you're paying for YouTube, you know, in that stock price, and you're getting all these other lottery ticket investments like Waymo, and like some of these other some of these other investments it has same thing with Amazon, you know, Amazon is Amazon cloud, it's their their investments, their venture capital investments and in other companies uh, is as well as the e commerce site. And I think, you know, all those separate is uh, is worth much more than where the stock is trading at right now. I have to give them private information. <clears throat> what else? Uh, so, oh, Joseph says the railroad companies are offering Teladoc to their employees. Yeah, you know, I mean, tel uh, virtual healthcare is the future, folks. Uh, okay, I mean, it is so much easier. Obviously, you know, obviously, virtual healthcare it's not going to replace everything. You're still going to go to the doctor for some things, and still going to need to get scans and, and stuff like that, but. You know, why not just do it from do what you can from the, the comfort of your own home? You know, it's less costly for the insurance providers. So obviously they're going to be pushing for it. Uh, it's easier for the patients as well as the doctors. They're going to be pushing for it. So as people become more comfortable with that virtual healthcare and those services, um, that is the direction. And Teladoc, again, is, you know, is just the, the undeniable leader in that space. Uh, so I, I really like really like its position there. And Barbell Approach and put Money Growth Parts. Okay, uh, what else? Do you have mid or small cap growth ETFs? So Wayne wants to know about uh, mid or small cap growth ETFs. Uh, not necessarily mid or small cap. We did do an ETF video uh, just last week, uh, 15 ETFs, uh, really kind of talking through which are the best ETFs out there you can invest in. Highly recommend, check out that video. It had some great great ideas in there as far as theme ETFs, you know, the, the cannabis, the EV, ETFs, uh, other theme ETFs like that, the growth ETF we had in there, we had a value, uh, a value and a dividend ETF in there, as well as the one that that, you know, the, the number one ETF that I'm buying in there. So definitely check that out. We are uh, an hour and a half into this, so uh, I'm going to cut it off for this week. Uh, next week, I think I'm going to be uh, live again next week because the week after that, we're making our move. So it's not going to be a, we're not going to be able to have a live session the week after that. Uh, going to be in Tampa on the 28th, and, and and then at a conference the week after that. So probably a recorded 
recorded Monday uh, videos for a couple of weeks after that. So we will have a live a live uh, session, a live Q and A next week on uh, Monday, 9 a.m. Eastern. Hope to hope to see you there. And um, if I didn't get to your question, please ask it in the chat below or in the comments below, and I'll try to get on it while I'm at the gym today. See you later.